Brother Woods, Brother Price, and brethren. I uh, discern by the response of the audience to Brother Woods' challenge that you suspect that I will decline. Of course, your, your suspicion is wrong. And we will uh, enter into a discussion about that, Brother Woods. I was to write on this piece of paper someplace in the scripture that stated that the Spirit well, was given to us in his person. Well, I've written on here that you have bound me here. I have to admit it, Brother Wood. You have bound me here. I'm not able to do that because the Spirit is nowhere in Scripture pictured as separate from his person. Every place I read about the Spirit, I'm reading about the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is himself. And when we read about the Holy Spirit, we're reading about him. He cannot dwell any other way than in his person. That seems very obvious to me. You'll observe that Brother Woods has been very adept in using language and tenses and word studies and charts. But after all is said and done, no apostle ever used this reasoning. I were to conclude from this that our generation is the first one that's had a problem with the Holy Spirit and that this most unique and non-apostolic approach to the Holy Spirit has been prompted by some new and strange revelation from God for this generation. We must resort to the apostles' doctrine for teaching about the Holy Spirit. And so that is what I have been doing. If it seems as though they are unrelated to the subject, that lies in the inability of my opponent to discern the connection. The covenant is based upon the postulate that the Holy Spirit indwells people, that God dwells in them, it proceeds upon that principle. That's why I make reference to the covenant. The fact that Jesus is a second man and that we are the sons of God, presume we have the Spirit of God. It absolutely has very much to do with the subject. Because if the Spirit does not indwell us, then we are not the sons of God. And I'm maintaining that he cannot indwell us without indwelling us personally. Resorting to the apostles' doctrine, there are not a few concepts immediately joined with the Holy Spirit and his connection with men. He is first of all called a seal, and the people of God are sealed with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1.13 tells us that ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. This sealing is associated with the common aspects of the kingdom of God. You heard the word of the truth the gospel of your salvation, in whom after that ye believe. Not a miraculous type order, something that all of God's people experience, trusting, believing, hearing the word of truth, then being sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. At least two questions are introduced here. Is this seal meant for all believers? And is the seal external to our persons? That it's common to all is evident by the fact here that it's connected with hearing the gospel, trusting in the word of the truth of the gospel, and believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Common aspects of salvation. Consider whether the Holy Spirit himself constitutes the seal or is merely the administrator of the seal. It is with the Spirit that we are sealed, the Apostles' Doctrine states. And in 2 Corinthians 1.22, it states that God is the administrator of the seal. That this seal is external to our persons is absolutely inconceivable. We are the ones that are sealed. The Holy Spirit is the seal. How can that possibly take place without there being a merger of these two spirits? 
one that makes for the confidence that we are of the Lord. In this Ephesians text, he concludes a note of great confidence that we have obtained an inheritance in him, and he bases his reasoning on the fact that they've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. If that was a mysterious concept that required elaborate charts and word studies, I find it difficult to believe that the Ephesians could derive comfort and consolation from that concept. A second concept, the apostles taught. Observe, we're teaching what the apostles taught about the Holy Spirit. He was the earnest of our inheritance, and he's placed within our hearts. In 2 Corinthians, the first chapter, and verse 22, who has sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. This is picturing the resultant conflict of faith, for in this tabernacle we we groan being burdened, the scriptures tell us, actually longing for the habitation of a resurrected body. God seeing this longing and groaning in the heart of the believer says that he has given us, in 2 Corinthians 5, 5, he has wrought us for the self-same thing, this inheritance we're longing for. He's made us for that and hath also given us the earnest of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit himself Something from heaven has been given to us as an earnest, a pledge, a down payment of what's to come. Now I insist that the Holy Spirit is an earnest, that he is a pledge, that I do have him, that I do possess him, that it's not figurative, that it's not metaphorical, that it is literal or it can't be an earnest. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance. It seems inconceivable to me to conclude otherwise than if we have not really received anything, we will not in the end receive anything. If the earnest consists of something impersonal, then the inheritance consists of something impersonal. If the earnest is not bodily, as he states it, and I'm not sure I know the full connotation of that term. If the Holy Spirit does not in his person dwell in us, then he will not in his person dwell in us in glory. God in his person will not dwell in us in glory. We will not be joined to the Lord in person, in glory. A denial of this constitutes a detraction from the glory of God. We have received this earnest of the Spirit to the praise of the glory of God, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. The term earnest is unique to the New Testament. It declares a, of a possession, not a theory or thought or concept. It's a pledge from God to you. It's declared to be a person the Holy Spirit, who nowhere is represented as being anything but a person. Because man is in the image of God, he cannot be satisfied with something that's impersonal. That's the jeopardy of being in the world. Things in the world detract from God. Man as a person can only be satisfied with another person who is the living God the first fruits of which is the Holy Spirit, the earnest of our inheritance. And we are going to inherit God. God is the rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Unless the Holy Spirit is residing in believers personally, they have no pledge. To be a pledge, He must be possessed. Or can the Spirit be possessed without enduring us personally? Or can he be a pledge without us having him? Or has God given us an earnest of a spirit without putting him in our heart? Why do men in attempt to thrust us into the maze of the ridiculous to justify untenable positions? I'm going to continue to assert in this debate that the issue is whether or not the spirit dwells in us and not the mode. The scripture says the spirit dwells in us says the earnest is in our hearts, the inmost citadel of your person. 
Therefore, we are always confident, the scripture says, knowing that while we are absent from the body, we are present with the Lord and confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. That statement resulted in 2 Corinthians 5, 5 through 8 as a result of knowing he had the earnest of the Spirit. Brother Woods has suggested we couldn't know it. What a tragic, what a tragic statement. The Word of God, the apostolic doctrine, assumes we can. Hereby we know that he dwelleth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. Now, if Brother Woods can't discern it, that's his problem. There are some of us that can. Praise the Lord. God has joined these things to the possession of the Holy Spirit as an earnest confidence and assurance. The Holy Spirit is a spirit of promise. He is called it in Ephesians 1.14, the Holy Spirit of promise. Ephesians 1.14. 14. Now, uh, the, holy, the promise of the Holy Spirit in these charts, very well, very well organized charts, was associated with promises that the Holy Spirit gave. But Ephesians 1.14 talks about the Holy Spirit of promise. That is a different matter. That text, of course, was not on the chart. Of ancient times, God did promise his Holy Spirit. He did. Ezekiel 36, chapter and verse 27, God said, I, this is God, I will put my spirit within you. Ephesians, Ezekiel 37, 14, and shall put my spirit in you. My question, was that a legitimate promise or not? Did God mean what he said or not? Was there a breakdown in the translation here? Perhaps some hidden meaning that is not obvious to all? Or could it be that this is, after all, the one of the promises that are yea and amen to the glory of God by us? God did promise the Holy Spirit. The Spirit himself is a representative of God. The Spirit himself is. We are a habitation of God through the Spirit. God says, I will dwell in them. The Holy Spirit and God do dwell in us, or language doesn't mean anything. Now, you can resort to all sorts of explanations. The apostles did not explain that the way Brother Woods has explained it. Now, I may fail in my ability to thoroughly refute some fancy arguments about this. But when all is said and done, the apostles did not argue like this. They did not lay this reasoning upon you. It is non-apostolic. They made the assertion. They made no apology for the assertion. They assumed everyone understood the assertion. They didn't elaborate on it. Brother Woods has. The matter of the spirit and believers is addressed using possessive terms in the scripture. The believer possesses the Holy Spirit. For instance, these terms, the spirit dwells in the believer. This is the possessive term. The scriptures teach that we receive the spirit. Uh, one text that was not on the chart that uh, we ought to bring to your attention, Romans 8, 15 Ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. There the reception of the Holy Spirit is associated with sonship, not miracles. Jesus himself prophesied that waters would flow out of the belly of him that believeth on me, not the apostles. That's not what the text says. It says, him that believeth on me. When the apostle elaborated on it, several years after Jesus spoke it, he said, This spake he of the Holy Ghost, which they that believe on him should receive. Now, is they that believe on him uh, restricted to the apostles? God is said to give the Holy Spirit. In 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, and verse 8, these are intensely personal terms. He who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. Now I call upon you to believe that he has given unto you his Holy Spirit. The Spirit is said to be in you. 
Now, we can haggle all night about in what sense he's in us, but he's in us. The scripture says the spirit is in you. Therefore, glorify God because he's in you. Glorify God in your body and in your spirit. I find it most difficult to conceive of him being in us at all if he is not in us in his person. The Holy Spirit is said to be in our hearts. There's nothing more closely associated with your person than your heart. And the Holy Spirit is said to be put by God as an earnest in your heart. 2 Corinthians 1.22 and Galatians 4.6 says, Because you are sons, not because you're apostles, because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. That the Spirit could be in your heart without literally in his person being in our hearts, is a concept not taught in the scriptures. And I presume that we are thought to be very foolish indeed to think that's the case. I maintain such a position as a position of ignorance. Think of this. The danger of falling away in the word of God is associated with those that retrogress into sin after having been made partakers of the Holy Ghost. Hebrews, the sixth chapter, and verse four. I ask you, have you been made a partaker of the Holy Ghost? And do you enjoy the communion of the Holy Ghost, or are these good things passed away also? And in startling contrast with the position in controversy, Jude declares that those are sensual who have not the Spirit, Jude 19. Now, I, I sense perhaps some have missed my point. My point is that the Scripture says that the issue is whether you have the Spirit or not. That is the issue. That's what the apostle said was the issue. He said, have not the Spirit, those that are sensual. He says, those that are sons have the Spirit. That's the issue. Those are the lines that have been drawn. That's the issue that the Holy Spirit has set forth. Having the Spirit or not having the Spirit. My esteemed opponent says the issue is in what sense we have the Spirit and in what sense we don't have the Spirit. He must take the responsibility, brethren, for that analysis. We have in us a principle of law unto death operating in our members, sin dwelling in us, it's called in Romans, the seventh chapter. Sin dwelleth in me. What a tragic thing it is. Something against which we must fight incessantly. We have the law, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus in our members. They're assisting us in this war against the law of sin and death in our members. The bestowment of the Holy Spirit into your heart sent by God as a result of the remission of your sins and because of the vicarious sacrifice of Christ helps our infirmities. It leads us from within and assists us in mortifying the deeds of our bodies. It helps us to live holy and righteously and godly in this present evil world. Now I maintain that my, the position of my opponent, as venerable a teacher as he may be, takes that promise from you and makes it a logical promise instead of a real promise and makes it a philosophical promise instead of a real promise. The Holy Spirit is in you. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ it involves the indwelling of the Spirit. You're baptized into the name of the Father and into the name of the Son and into the name of the Spirit. And you know that the name of the Father and the name of the Spirit and the name of Christ is their persons, not a mere appellation. I close with these words of our Lord. And with the commentary of John the Apostle, who knew what he meant, whether anyone here does or not, John did. Jesus cried out, He that believeth on me, is there one here that does? That's a universal term. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And John, the beloved apostle, from the foundation stones of the new Jerusalem, arises up and interprets this text. He says, this spake he of the Spirit, 
which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. I proclaim to you that Jesus Christ is glorified, that there are those that believe in him, that the Holy Spirit has been given, and that the Holy Spirit has been received.